Good evening, I'm Ian Hanamancy. Tonight, concern from doctors, chaos in airports, and closing borders. What you need to know about the new coronavirus variant. This variant has a large number of mutations, and some of these mutations have some worrying characteristics. Tonight, the scope of the new threat, what we know and what we don't, as countries, including Canada, lock out travelers. As you know, that it's very difficult to keep a virus like this out uh, entirely. How vaccine makers are planning to tackle it and why this pandemic isn't over until it's over everywhere. Our experts are standing by to focus on the science. Also tonight, the Prime Minister tours the flood zone as BC prepares for another weather punch. Plus, worries about what lies beneath and getting access to clean water. I'm not a, a scientist or anything like that, but right now, it's I wouldn't want to be swimming in it. Why a popular beauty company is quitting social media accounts. It produces standards um, that are unattainable, that are unhealthy. And the return of an iconic Canadian venue. These are good seats. Isn't that great? <laughs> Inside the painstaking process, to restore the magic of Massey Hall. This is The National. On this Friday night, markets have shuttered. Travel restrictions are slamming into place as the World Health Organization identified a new coronavirus variant of concern today. So today we are announcing B11529 as a variant of concern named Omicron. Omicron has joined Alpha, Beta, Gamma and Delta as a variant of the virus to watch closely. Scientists know it has some worrying mutations. It seems to spread quickly and has been found in multiple countries. That alone has prompted an anxious global reaction. But Christine Burak shows us there's so much we don't yet know. One thing the pandemic has taught us is that reliable science takes time. And with Omicron, this is just getting started. There are no known cases of the new variant in Canada, but public health experts say it's just a matter of time. We'll be looking for it. And I don't think people should be surprised if we did get a detection. The World Health Organization has named this latest variant detected in South Africa as Omicron, warning countries it is a variant of concern. This variant has a large number of mutations, and some of these mutations have some worrying characteristics. In other words, Omicron could be more infectious, could cause more severe illness, and could get around immune defenses. Scientists estimate the variant has 32 tiny mutations in its spike protein. That's a problem because previous infections and vaccines have shown our immune system a version of that spike. Mutations could make it harder for antibodies to recognize this variant and stick to it in order to block it from entering our cells. However, it's early days. We need to get the virus in people's and scientists and, and research labs' hands uh, to test to see if these uh, doom and gloom predictions actually pan out. Already, reports say a Canadian visiting Hong Kong is infected, possibly catching the variant from a South African traveller staying in the same quarantine hotel. It's not clear if either are sick. We understand that people are concerned. The good thing is that we have monitoring systems around the world to detect these variants very quickly. Using virus surveillance, scientists have now identified roughly 100 cases in countries worldwide, including Botswana, Belgium and Israel. You're seeing the world be very, very cautious right now and, and proactive in saying we've identified something. We need to get ahead of this as much as we can. Scientists insist public health measures still work and travel bans can slow this variant down. But as long as this virus is still circulating and people remain unvaccinated, new and potentially more dangerous variants remain a real risk. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. Well, infectious diseases specialist Dr. Isaac Bogosh is going to stay with us through our coverage of this new variant. And, and Dr. Bogosh, first of all, uh, this sounds very alarming to a lot of people. Uh, from your perspective, how big a threat are we looking at? Uh, I, I think we have to approach this with a degree of healthy respect and caution. The, the big questions are, to what extent is it more transmissible? Uh, does it evade the immunity that we have from vaccination and does it chip away at that protection from immunity or the immunity we get from recovery from infection 
and does it cause more significant symptoms? I think the key thing here is it would be extremely unusual for a variant to emerge that completely erases the protection we have uh, from vaccination. It might slowly chip away at it, but it's very unlikely that it, it completely erodes the immune protection that we have with two and even three doses of the vaccine. All right, lots more questions to come, uh, so please stand by. Well, very quickly today, several countries moved to restrict travel from southern Africa. Canada, one of those countries that did that. Ashley Burke takes us through the new rules for travelers coming here. There aren't any direct flights from South Africa, but there are ways to reach Canada. And now the government's closing those doors to keep the Omicron variant out. We are banning the entry of foreign nationals into Canada that have traveled through Southern Africa in the last 14 days. That ban includes seven different African countries, stretching from Mozambique to Namibia, and officials say that list could expand. It's very difficult to keep a virus like this out uh, entirely. So I would not be surprised if many countries over the next days, now that they've been alerted, might go back and try and find out if the virus had already arrived. Officials estimate up to 700 people traveled to Canada from the affected countries in the last two weeks. They're currently being told to self-isolate until they test negative. As for Canadians and permanent residents trying to get home, they must get a COVID test to enter Canada in the last city they transited from and then quarantine even if they're vaccinated. Upon entering Canada, they will be required to wait in an approved hotel until the result of their day one test result is known. The announcement came amid mounting political pressure. Canadians expect decisive action from this Liberal government. What is the, is there a plan? What is the plan to keep Canadians safe from the African variant? Yes, Mr. Speaker, there is a plan. The premiers of the two largest provinces, Ontario and Quebec, also called for tougher border measures. We see that uh, uh, there's at least a case in Belgium, so we have to be uh, very careful. Canadian officials said these new measures may seem like overkill, but after everything they've learned from other variants of concern, are doing this out of an abundance of caution. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. Starting Monday, the U.S. will ban travelers from the same seven countries as Canada with the addition of Malawi. Officials today also warn that list could grow if the variant continues to spread. I've decided that we're going to be cautious, make sure there's no travel except for American citizens who are able to come back. Uh, but uh, we don't know a lot about the variant except that it is a great concern. It seems to spread rapidly. News of the variant sent stocks tumbling, the S&P 500, down more than 2%. And there was a familiar pandemic pattern. Airline and travel companies among the sectors getting hit the hardest, while companies for home exercise equipment and video conferencing actually jumped. The TSX took a similar drop, with energy stocks in particular seeing steep declines. As Chris Brown shows us, Europe was even quicker than Canada and the U.S. with travel bans. That caused disruption and potentially nipping an industry comeback in the bud. Just in time for Christmas, international travel red lists and COVID no-go zones are back for a second straight holiday travel season. Now the circumstances become unpredictable again, right? Sounds like a bit of an omen for future problems like we've seen in the previous, in the previous year. Europe's travel industry had just gotten airborne again, but with surging infections and much of the continent already either in lockdowns or contemplating them, the EU was one of the first to ban flights from southern Africa. They should be suspended until we have a clear understanding about the danger posed by this new variant. Hundreds of passengers arriving in Amsterdam had the ban imposed mid-flight, so they were stuck for hours when they landed waiting for PCR tests to be cleared. At London's Heathrow, they were luckier, landing just before Britain's new restrictions kicked in. I feel extremely relieved because, yeah, who knows how long this is going to last. In South Africa, though, the measures were met by anger from government officials who called them premature. The reaction of uh, some of uh, uh, countries in terms of uh, imposing uh, travel bans and, 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 and such measures are completely against the norms and standards 
as guided by the World Health Organization. I think most governments... This British travel industry rep urged people not to cancel their upcoming travel plans and just I see. I think it's inevitable that along the way you're going to get situations which will crop up where, you know, that will go back a step, but hopefully it's only a short-term issue. While the flight restrictions are limited to Southern Africa, the fear, of course, is that they could be expanded if the variant spreads rapidly in other places. Chris Brown, CBC News, London. And let's go back to Dr. Isaac Bogosh and, and travel bans. Dr. Bogosh, are they effective? You know, I know th there's such an urgent need to do something, but often travel bans, especially focused travel bans, are, are largely ineffective. Uh, we've heard about travel bans to Southern Africa, yet we've also heard about cases that have popped up in Hong Kong, in Belgium, in Israel, and other parts of the world. Especially, you know, you hear about this case in Belgium. This was a woman who traveled from uh, Egypt through Turkey back to Belgium with no contact at all to Southern Africa. So I think we have to ask ourselves, are travel bans, especially focused travel bans, really going to be that effective in preventing the spread of this infection and this variant? It's unlikely to be. All right. Well, we're going to have a longer chat, both with you and Dr. Susie Hoda, a little later in the program on travel bans and uh, many of the other questions that have come up today. Thanks. My pleasure. Concerns over the new variant come as COVID cases in this country continue to rise. Ontario saw nearly 930 new cases, the highest daily count in nearly 10 weeks. Health officials in the Kingston area have now lowered indoor gathering limits to 10 people ahead of the holiday season. Quebec also saw a rise in cases today. We have to be careful in the next uh, weeks. That's why we didn't announce the measure we proposed for Christmas. Quebec's premier urging caution ahead of the holidays as health officials reported more than 1,000 new cases today for the first time since May. The federal government introduced new legislation today in an effort to protect health care workers from protesters. Every day, health care workers are coming forward and speaking out. They are exhausted, they are discouraged, and they are fearful. And the sad reality is that these sorts of threats predate the pandemic. We've heard their calls, and today we're taking action. Bill C-3 would make it illegal to intimidate or obstruct health care workers and patients seeking care. Those convicted under the proposed law could face up to 10 years in prison. The bill also brings in 10 days of paid sick leave in federally regulated sectors, a move Ottawa says could benefit nearly 600,000 workers. Well, today, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau paid his first visit to B.C. since record rainfall ravaged the province with floods and slides. And he announced how all Canadians might give extra help. Uh, hearts are going out uh, to folks who are working really, really hard to rebuild their lives and build a stronger future. Um, send them your support because this is what we do as Canadians. Trudeau said that for every dollar donated to the Canadian Red Cross's special appeal for B.C., the federal and B.C. governments will bump it up to $3. As well, the Committee of Federal and Provincial Ministers will work along with Indigenous leadership to guide support for those affected by this extreme weather. Well, David Common was at work today in the Fraser Valley once again. And, and David, what did you see there? Well, an awful lot of vulnerability still out there, a lot of water as well. And I did note that as the Prime Minister was landing today in British Columbia, Environment Canada did something it's never done before, issuing a red alert over two new storm systems that are inbound to this region. And the concern, of course, is what they are bringing. These are warnings that have never happened before, but are because these extreme weather systems are happening much more often. There is nothing quite like seeing the damage firsthand, or rather stepping through it. This was a front lawn until this creek burst its banks, pouring through the community. The Prime Minister visiting today briefly, his first to BC since the destructive storm, as soldiers worked to shore up flood defences. Twelve days ago, the water would have been above my head here, so things have improved, but the cleanup, it's going to take months, if not years, cost billions, and that's before we even talk about the necessary improvements to flood defenses, which have been proven to be woefully insufficient. 
And quickly, two new storm systems on Saturday and then Tuesday are set to bring more rain collectively than the system which caused catastrophe. And no one is quite sure what will happen. And the ground is super saturated. This is a situation we have never faced before. It's not just that 20 centimeters of rain is expected, but the system will melt snow at higher elevations, pouring down into valleys and again threatening to overwhelm highways and inundate communities. Unleashing three storms back to back to back, uh, it's our responsibility to allow all of the other parts of society to know how serious that could be. And again, I can't overstate the uncertainty. My fear is if the Nooksack overflows again. The Prime Minister was able to drive to one community where the water has receded. Some areas, though, are only accessible by air, like the Shack and First Nation, caked in a meter of mud that trampled and crushed most everything in its path. As much as this is BC's nightmare, it'll also be the federal government's problem. Not just sending in soldiers, but digging into a much deeper wallet to help repair and react to increasingly frequent and destructive weather disasters. And with more storms on the horizon, Ian, there is certainly some roads uh, that have been reopened in recent days that are now set to close again over fears there will be new flooding. The Prime Minister meeting with the Premier this evening talking about just that and the big cost to try to restore everything that's out there. Already there are some roads that have been completely washed away. Five to six kilometres of roads in some cases that have just fallen into a much bigger river system. Yeah, David, it's, uh, there's nothing like seeing it firsthand, as you pointed out in your story. Thank you very much. Now, all that pounding rain has stirred up a lot more than anxiety. Sewage and animal waste are just some of the biohazards that can make drinking water harmful. Olivia Stefanovic shows us how large a threat that is. The high water mark is just uh, behind you here. There normally isn't a pond on Doug Johnstone's family farm. The fire pit is a water pit right now. We're not going to be burning for a while. The flood reshaped this landscape. Now concern is sinking in over what it brings. You've had uh, manure pits potentially overflow. You've had septic fields overflow. So the, the water that's in the fields that has to drain away is a, a veritable cesspool. About 700 properties on the Sumas Prairie are under a do not consume water advisory, meaning it's not safe to even boil, only flush. Debris like tires and large farming equipment can be found floating all around. But what concerns residents isn't so much about what can be seen, it's about what can't. We know there are hazardous and potentially toxic material in these uh, floodwaters, which is why we need to complete an environmental assessment of the area to ensure it is safe. Experts fear the impact may reach beyond the borders of the current advisory. Even though flooding might take place in one location, there could potentially be subsurface flow of those contaminants that could get into other people's drinking water supplies. She's urging private well owners to test their water quality, whether they're in the flood zone or not. If you are on a private well, just remembering as a, as a well owner that your water supply is your responsibility. The province says it's monitoring the threat. There is significant attention paid to, uh, to water quality and the ability to make sure that when people go back, it is safe for them. Until Johnstone knows his supply is safe, he's hauling in water from the city for his kennel dogs just one more task as he yearns to return to a normal routine. Olivia Stefanovic, CBC News, Abbotsford, B.C. In Atlanta, Canada, military help is on its way to southwestern Newfoundland after a record rainstorm destroyed sections of highways, leaving communities isolated. The Prime Minister made the announcement on Twitter this morning, saying Canadian Forces members will provide logistical support and transportation assistance in the region. The extreme weather left severe damage on several highways in and out of port of -Basque, Newfoundland, leaving thousands cut off from the rest of the island.
The pandemic has had a huge impact on kids' education, and now it's creating a staffing crunch. The most uh, reliable pool of substitute teachers is always retired teachers, but they've dried up because they're so concerned about um, the potential for catching COVID. How schools across the country are trying to fill the supply gap. Plus, could the new Omicron variant evade vaccines? Coming up, our panel of doctors on how concerned we should be and how vaccine makers are already planning for it. And a little later. After a multi-million dollar renovation, the lights are up once again. You know, it's like somebody's living room and you feel embraced when you come in here. The rebirth of a Canadian music institution. We're back in two. Welcome back. In Nova Scotia, the RCMP is investigating after a fire destroyed a lobster pound just days before lobster season is set to open. Video shows the heavy smoke coming from the plant in the southwestern part of the province last night. No injuries have been reported. Officials say the fire wasn't put out until early this morning. This is the same plant that was damaged last fall amid tension between commercial and indigenous fishermen in the region. The pandemic has created yet another shortage. Supply teachers. It's forced Toronto's public school board this week to bring back some unvaccinated staff. Deanna Sumanag Johnson looks at what's behind the problem. The Durham region east of Toronto has had a population boom during the pandemic. Great for the region, not so good when it comes to hiring enough school staff to teach all those new kids. It's the occasional teachers where we're feeling uh, the crunch right now. In fact, the board has resorted to putting out an ad saying they're hiring uncertified emergency supply teachers. The main requirements? A university degree completed or in progress, experience working with kids, and a clean police check. There are many people out there considering employment and education, and this is an opportunity for those students who may be in university or already have a degree to become part of an emergency occasional teacher list. A lack of supply teachers isn't entirely new, but the pandemic has made the problem much worse for several reasons. The most uh, reliable pool of substitute teachers is always retired teachers in their first five or ten years of retirement. Uh, but they've dried up because they are so concerned about um, the potential for catching COVID. Put that together with school staff who refuse to get vaccinated or get tested regularly, plus teachers having to call in sick for even a minor cough and you get the perfect storm. More substitute teachers needed than ever before and fewer of the usual ones available to work. In Prince George, British Columbia, uncertified teachers are preferred to what the district has occasionally had to do, taking support staff away from kids with special learning needs. Our district is heavily reliant upon uncertified people coming into our schools and offering uh, teaching employment. As a union leader, I am not happy that we had to advocate for that. But as a union leader of struggling members, it was the only way moving forward. And what they're all saying is many parents, while not thrilled about the prospect, accept it as a preferable alternative to sending students home because there's no one to teach them, something several regions have had to do. Deanna Sumanak Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. After a three-year renovation, an iconic music hall is back. We wanted to make sure that we were keeping that side of it right. exactly the way people remember it. Coming up, how Massey Hall got new life while holding on to its old charm. Today, we are announcing B11529 as a variant of concern named Omicron. It now has a name and the attention of Canada's and the world's public health community. But with so many still dealing with surges of the Delta variant, researchers are still weighing the dangers of Omicron. Well, joining us now to give us some context on this new variant, infectious disease specialist Dr. Isaac Bogosh and Dr. Susie Hoda, both in Toronto. And Dr. Hoda, let me start with you. How concerned are you with this news? 
I mean, it's very worrisome. I know it's early days and we don't have a lot of information and we're going to have to watch very closely what does develop in the next few days. But so far, what it looks like, at least from South Africa, is it's rapidly taken over Delta. And the Delta variant, we're all still struggling with in terms of transmission. So if this is more transmissible, then this new variant is definitely a concern to be watching. The other question is, just how much of immune evasion, which is kind of the ability of these um, these variants to either sort of resist the effects of vaccines and also result in reinfections, just how much of that is going to come out of this variant? Um, there are some suggestions because there are a large number of mutations around the targets that the vaccines really kind of focus on, that there may be a, a real problem with vaccine effectiveness. We don't know yet. We're just going to have to see. And Dr. Bogosh, you touched on this earlier in the program, but as you were reading through the materials today, I guess, the reports on this, as obviously Dr. Hoda was as well, but, but what sort of questions does this raise for you? Yeah, I think the big question is, to what extent is this more transmissible than Delta, if at all? And how much of what we are seeing now is related to sampling error or to this being truly more transmissible. I'd also love to know the clinical impact of this. Does this potentially cause more significant illness versus Delta? And again, like Dr. Hoda said, it, does this uh, have any degree of immune evasion? And if so, to what extent versus um, you know the, the, the virus and, uh, and how well will our vaccines hold up against us? I think one positive takeaway point is that it would be extremely unusual for the vaccines to be rendered useless with uh, a mutation or even several mutations like this. So it's even if there does seem to be a chipping away at the effectiveness of vaccines, it'll likely be a gradual chipping away, and the vaccines will still likely confer very significant protection, especially against more severe infections. That's speculation on my part. Obviously, these are studies that have to be uh, undertaken, uh, but I, I think that we'll probably see that in the coming days and weeks ahead. And, and Dr. Bogar, speaking of vaccines, uh, Moderna uh, issued a news release today, and one of the things they talked about is that they're studying two multivalent booster candidates in the clinic that were designed to anticipate situations such as those that have emerged with the Omicron variant. Um, what's your reaction to that? Fantastic. I mean, uh, there's going to be a time where we're going to need to pull the trigger on new vaccines and updated vaccines. We're still using vaccines that are really designed toward the original virus that emerged from Wuhan, China, close to two years ago. And obviously, the virus has changed significantly since then. If there truly is immune evasion, we will need an updated uh, version of the vaccine. Unfortunately, with the mRNA technology, you're able to do that very, very quickly. Dr. Hoda, we're seeing case numbers rise in various provinces and, uh, you know, a, sort of a, this residual level of anxiety that a lot of people have during the fourth wave and now this new news about the variant. So I, I just wonder in terms of kind of practical real world advice, what should we be doing differently, if anything, now? I'm not sure it's different, but I think our message about try to improve on vaccine uptake is, is more important than ever now. Um, you know, I completely agree with what Dr. Bogosh has said, that it's really unlikely that the vaccines are going to be completely useless against this variant. And, you know, we still have our own, you know, issues with Delta transmission, et cetera. I think vaccination is really one of the most important strategies we can put into place. And this doesn't just apply to us. It applies globally. So whatever we can do to try and improve vaccine uptake across the world is going to benefit us all. Um, so that's a really big part of it. The, the next things are public health measures do work. We know that they're blind to variant types. And if we run into problems with the case counts really going up and transmission going rampant, we can use, you know, the strategies we've used before. It may mean that we have to slow down reopening plans or alter reopening plans. And we just have to watch and tailor according to what's happening. So these are the two main things. I'll say the other things that are really important are um, highlighted by this case. The fact that in South Africa, they had such excellent genomic surveillance that they caught all this rather quickly and had a lot of information to share. We need to make sure that we're in a position that we can actually detect these kinds of problems in Canada really well and communicate them out and focus, you know, containment around that. And, and Dr. Bogosh, talk to us a little bit more about something Dr. Hoda brought up, and it's often described as, as vaccine equity. I know a lot of doctors have been talking about this throughout. How do we, how do we achieve that? How do we persuade rich countries like Canada to, to help uh, distribute vaccines around the world? The short-term solutions, sadly, are charitable. We have to give vaccines to lower-income countries. We have to support programs like the COVAX program 
to help support vaccine equity. But the more meaningful longer term solutions are really enabling lower income countries to manufacture vaccines, to talk about patents and data sharing so that people can actually produce vaccines in those settings. They don't have to be reliant on charitable donations. One other point that Dr. Hoda brought up that I thought was fantastic is the data sharing. And we had South African scientists and scientists from Botswana identify this variant and share this variant data very quickly with the international community. And that's why we're all talking about it today. The answer to this is to not punish people for sharing data by issuing travel bans. Can you imagine the, uh, would anyone else be so inclined to share data of a variant that emerges in their country if the response to that is, oh, we're gonna start banning travel to them? And we know these policies are not that effective in the first place, I think we could be doing a lot more to be supporting low-income countries, not just with vaccine equity, but also with supporting them through these processes when a variant emerges there. Dr. Hoda, literally less than 30 seconds uh, for this last uh, question and answer, but there's so much worry around the world today. Uh, is this going to make you sleep, uh, going to make sleep more difficult for you tonight? You know, I, I think the most important thing for us to do is watch what happens in the next few days. It's not time to panic on this. Um, you know, we've been through new variants before, but let's keep our attention on this and, uh, and try to modify things according to what we learn. All right. Well, as always, thanks to both of you for uh, giving us your time tonight. My pleasure. Thank you. When we come back, a leading beauty retailer is walking away from social media. Where there's danger, you wouldn't choose to take people there, so we're not doing it. Coming up, why Lush says it's trying to protect its customers, plus. Up next, the lights are up on a historic music institution and its multi-million dollar reboot. A few years ago, we took you inside one of Canada's most legendary concert venues as it underwent a painstaking renovation. Toronto's Massey Hall has been closed for more than three years with some construction delays due to the pandemic. But this week, the iconic building finally got back to business. It is so beautiful and at 127 years old, it has finally received some serious upgrades. Eli Glasner shows us the new and improved venue ready to serve audiences for generations to come. Oh my gosh. It's absolutely amazing. For over three years, Massey Hall was a work in progress, closed for much needed repairs and renovations. I mean, it feels like it got an incredible shine, <laughs> but it doesn't <laughs> feel that different. You know, it's always a big event to come to Massey Hall. They Out of the range. Jim Cuddy knows this room well. Lou Rodeo has performed here dozens of times. He's also been here as a fan, experiencing some of the hall's many legendary performances. I mean, I've seen some of my best shows up in the, up in the second balcony. Van Morrison from up there. Built in 1894 by Hart Massey as a gift to the city, many who have stepped into the world-renowned hall describe it as a warm, welcoming space. You talked about when you've come to see shows here in the past. What is it about this place that gives you that feeling of like, okay, this is, this is special? Yeah, you, you know that's the indescribable thing. I mean, you sit here and, and you just feel very comfortable. You know, it's like somebody's living room. There are some living rooms that are meant to impress and some that are, that are meant to, to uh, you know, embrace. And you feel embraced when you come in here. Oh, it's a huge part of the magic. As Massey Hall CEO Jesse Kumagai explained, part of the goal of the renovations was keeping Canada's premier concert hall welcoming while increasing its versatility. The seats on the ground floor now slide under the stage for general admission shows. You can see the little tractors under there that will come out and pick up every row of seats. New elevators and seating locations have increased accessibility. Plus, the new stage is higher. Oh, man. What do you think of that? These are good seats. Isn't that great? <laughs> man. I mean, these used to be some of the worst seats in the house. Yeah, yeah. And now, I mean, just this like the relationship nice. between performer and audience oh, is... Wow. This is like truly being side stage. It's pretty great, isn't it? The 
other part of the magic of Massey was the sound. Even with the chicken wire covering the cracking plaster, there was something about the acoustics, the site for seminal shows like the greatest jazz concert ever, or Neil Young live at Massey Hall in 71, or Rush in 76. So before the hall closed, they took many measurements with the hall full and empty to capture the acoustics. We wanted to make sure that we were keeping that side of it right. exactly the way people remember it. And then for the artist experience, we wanted to make it a little bit easier. Of course, there's nothing easy about rescuing and renovating the historic hall, a process requiring the cooperation of three levels of government and a budget of over $184 million. It's more than down to the wire. As we waited for a pause in the construction noise, we sat down with the architect who made it happen, Marianne McKenna. We began with, you know, clear instructions from the musicians who loved this place that we were to change nothing, <laughs> fix everything, change nothing, which quickly went by the wayside that we had to move to uh, big improvements to improve everything about the place. For some parts, they took inspiration from history, uncovering and highlighting the flourishes that made Massey Hall stand out. The intricate plaster patterns on the ceiling and the luminous stained glass windows previously hidden behind plywood. Then there's the new part, a seven-story tower with rehearsal studios, a new performance venue, a bar, and yes, much-needed bathrooms. But how to get there? Enter the glass passerelles. You'll see people walking on the outside of the building and looking at those stained glass windows up close. And, um, you know, it'll be a, a huge kind of experience to go back to the lobbies. As the familiar signs of Massey Hall spring back to life, the question remains. After the pandemic and all we've endured, will fans rush back to this shared space? The joy in the room from just being with other people and remembering what it feels like to experience this together is, is overwhelming. It's overwhelming. And so after a long hibernation, Massey Hall reopened. As the crowd jumped to their feet to welcome back the man who's played this stage more than any other, Gordon Lightfoot. Already the schedule is filling up with the next wave of music makers, such as Majid Johnson, Mustafa the Poet, City in Color, and Tanya Tagak each ready for their taste of the Massey magic. This is a post-COVID gift. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs> Eli Glasner, CBC News, Toronto. A lot of love there for music and for Massey Hall and for our producer, Greg Hobbs. These stories, and it's the third one that he's done in this series of the renovation, has been a labor of love as well. The world of musical theater has lost a titan. Composer and lyricist Stephen Sondheim has died. Everything free in America for a small fee in America. Stephen Sondheim's lyrics cut to the core of what his characters felt in their heart and also what that said about the human condition. Something for everyone, a comedy tonight. This body comedy was Sondheim's first Broadway hit where he also composed the score. But future triumphs would revolutionize the art form and bring a sophistication perhaps matched only by the likes of Noel Coward or Cole Porter. You here at last on the ground. And what a range of subject matter. Sondheim could bring fresh insight into the nature of love and loss. This piece won the Pulitzer Prize. Sondheim won six Tony Awards for Best Musical Score. I've said repeatedly that I believe that teaching is a sacred profession and that art is a form of teaching. So, with the help of Bernadette, I'd like to teach you a little. Today, Bernadette Peters paid tribute. He gave me so much to sing about, she said of her close friend. Thank you for all the gifts you gave the world. Stephen Sondheim died at home at the age of 91.
beauty company Lush is taking a stance against some big social media platforms. I do think it would be wonderful if more companies responded to uh, what they see going on with social media. Coming up, what's behind the decision to walk away? On Black Friday, one of the busiest shopping days of the year, there were protests outside a few Amazon warehouses and distribution centers. Climate protesters and labor advocates joined causes in a campaign they call Make Amazon Pay. The goal is to get the online giant to commit to improving working conditions for employees and pledge greater sustainability efforts. A beauty retailer is staging its own protest against some social media platforms. Today, Lush Cosmetics stopped posting and engaging on Instagram, Facebook, and other sites until the platforms make changes to prioritize users' mental health. Nisha Patel looks at the campaign and how effective it might be. In lieu of us coming off of social media, we are... Lush is wiping away its social media presence. The bath products chain will no longer use Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, or Snapchat, dropping free access to millions of followers in North America alone. I'm so over looking at my phone. <laughs> Shoppers like Kate Backus approve. If they think it's better for people, then why not? The company is staying on Twitter and YouTube. Lush estimates not engaging could lose nearly $17 million. The goal? To get social media giants to make platforms safer for the mental health of young people. Where there's danger, you wouldn't choose to take people there. So we're not doing it. Still, for such an unusual move, there are questions about motivation. Some employees have alleged online that Lush tried to suppress union efforts. Does leaving social media also allow you to escape criticism? Would it be nice to, to be able to switch off all criticism forever? Yes. Uh, I can't wait, but is that likely? No. Experts say whatever the reasoning, other brands should take a stand. Calling attention to the harms being done is, is not a bad thing. Many big companies, including Coca-Cola, paused advertising on Facebook and Instagram in July 2020. But the corporate boycott to stop hate speech fizzled out, and it did little to impact Facebook's bottom line. I do think it would be wonderful if more companies responded to uh, what they see going on with social media. Explosive whistleblower reports about Facebook and Instagram this fall laid bare the impact on users' mental health. It produces standards um, that are unattainable, that are unhealthy. But for anything about social media to change, the movement must get bigger. Probably the solution is going to involve consumer boycotts and company boycotts, but it's probably also going to need to evolve eventually regulation. For now, Lush says it will stay away, waiting for social media companies to clean up their act. Nisha Patel, CBC News, Toronto. A year after a pandemic hiatus, one of Santa's legendary helpers is back. Ho, 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 Merry Christmas! His very merry return is our moment. Next. For Santa's helpers, 70-year-old George McKay, this year is a return to form after a difficult 2020. The pandemic forced his holiday work online. He had a battle with cancer, but he said what kept him going was hoping he would one day put on that red suit again, and he has. His Christmas comeback is our moment. Ho, 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 Merry Christmas! It's just the joy of the season, spreading it for everybody, making everybody happy. Last year was a bit of a, a bummer for everybody. But this year, look at it, it's back. This is what it's all about. The children, the parents, everybody here is having fun. Christmas is about good times and fun. And just so all the boys and girls know, don't be afraid this year, Santa will visit every house. Santa is double vaccinated. I'm getting my third vaccination just before Christmas Eve. When she was first born with Santa. <laughs> this is my 46th season doing it. I actually have a young lad that I'm going to see later this evening. I held him when he was three days old. He's now a very proud member of the Peel Regional Police Department. What do you want for Christmas? Lego. That's what it's about. Memories through the years. This is my life. I love this. This is what, in my heart, is so important. How can that not cheer you up? 46 years, lots of stories, including a couple. They sat on his knees and, and uh, proposed and eventually got 
engaged. He has five different suits. He works up to 14 hours a day, except, of course, for Christmas Day when the real Santa takes over. That's The National for November 26th. Good night.